Welcome everyone to our first Anthropology Cafe of the semester and the first virtual Anthropology Cafe. My name is Elise Waterston and I am chair of the Department of Anthropology. We are really thrilled. There are so many of you joining today. We have about 150 people signed up, which is awesome. Now, usually Professor Atiba Rougier, who many of you know, welcomes all of us to the cafe. But unfortunately, uh, Atiba is unable to be with us because of a family emergency and he sends his regrets. But I'd like to acknowledge Atiba, whose vision for the Anthropology Cafe has brought it to the Department of Anthropology for several very successful years now. So thank you, Atiba, for all your hard work in making the Anthropology Cafe happen. So before we get started with our presentation, um, some housekeeping. First of all, it's important for you to know that we are taping this event, and that's so that students and all those who are unable to attend can view it at a later time, uh, and then we'll let you know when and where it will be posted. So second, we ask that you please keep yourself muted and also turn your camera off. Thank you for that. Um, and finally, I want you to know that we, we do expect to have time for question and answer, Q&A. Um, and what we, we ask that you post your questions in the chat and direct your questions to Barbara Cassidy only. Barbara is our department administrator and she is our Zoom whiz. So when we get to the Q&A portion of this event, Barbara will call on individual persons and, and ask you to unmute yourself and pose your question. Okay, so that's the housekeeping. And now I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Hiva Yusiante, who is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University. Giva is an educator, a scholar, a journalist, and an emergency responder, an EMT and firefighter. She is the author of two amazing books and many, many articles. I love how she writes. As you know, Giva will be speaking today about her award-winning book, Threshold, Emergency Responders on the US-Mexico Border. Her first book is titled Savage Frontier, Making News and Security on the Argentine Border, which is a rich and compelling ethnography. You know, many of you know that these days more and more anthropologists are looking to write in ways that grabs the reader's attention and makes them want to read more, to read that next sentence, that next paragraph, that next chapter. Yiva isn't just looking to do that, she does it, and she does it successfully. Hers is a model of clear, graceful writing. You open up one of her books or an essay she's written and she hooks you, keeps you there throughout the whole narrative. A remarkable achievement. So with that introduction, it is my pleasure and my honor to bring you Yiva Yusiante. Thank you, Elise, for this beautiful and extremely generous introduction. And thank you also, Barbara, for setting this up. It's um, a pleasure to be here um, talking at the Anthropology Cafe, even though I do not see you all. Um, I, I, I feel this community. And let me uh, begin sharing my screen with you. So I will be talking about the research I did for my book, Threshold. And the story is much, uh, it starts some years ago, but where I want to begin is three years ago in 2015, in October, uh, to, in 2017, October, three years ago, the finalists who were selected to design uh, President Donald Trump's signature campaign promise the big and beautiful wall unveiled eight prototypes. They were built along the existing fence in the San Diego border area. Four of them were made of reinforced concrete and the other four were made of mixed materials, including steel. 
and they all had to meet and met the principal requirements that Customs and Border Protection outlined for this new barrier. That is, they were physically imposing in height, 30 feet tall, they were engineered to prevent climbing over, digging under, or breaching the structure using torches, sledgehammers, and axes. And the northern side, that is the side that's facing the United States, had to be aesthetically pleasing, although that's a matter of taste, I suppose. What's important is that, at least publicly, the proponents of the wall sought a structure that would not rely on razor wire or on electric shocks to deter people from crossing. It would be too embarrassing to see wounded bodies on the evening news or on social media. So as the owner of one company that bid for the contract told the journalists, he was proposing a humane obstruction. I quote, I just didn't want to wake up on a Sunday morning and read about, you know, a dozen Guatemalan kids that were electrocuted or seriously injured that would not have been something that my conscience would allow. So this double imperative of the wall, it must be effective at stopping an authorized entry, but also elegant, called for a particular security aesthetic, a barrier that appears to be innocuous even though it is intended to harm. Or in other words, the beauty of the wall hinges on its successful camouflage. The contest had no winner. After testing the prototypes to assess their constructability, breaching potential, and aesthetics, Customs and Border Protection found that they all failed in one way or another, and they selected certain design attributes that they liked to upgrade the already existing designs uh, for the fences that they had. The prototypes were demolished, uh, and that so put, put that put. Um, put aside or put an end to this bizarre, surreal pageant. Since then, we have also learned that not everyone in the administration was on board with the idea of humane ob obstruction. Two journalists for the New York Times who interviewed government officials involved in the matter reported that the president talked about securing the border by means of water-filled trenches or moats, of, or moats filled with alligators. And his other ideas included painting the wall mate black so that it get heated uh, in, uh, in the sun and would be too hot to the touch, um, and as well as adding spikes on top. But the focus of, on this bizarre spectacle distracted us from the weaponization of terrain that has been long underway in the region, where both the built environment and the natural topography have been um, widely used to enable and facilitate violence, which is the main concern that underlies my research and um, which will be the focus of my talk today. So rhetoric aside, barriers along the border are neither humane nor aesthetically pleasing. At least that's not how residents of border towns see the spools of concertina wire or razor wire these images are from Southern Arizona. Soldiers were deployed to the area um, now two years ago on election day in November 2018, uh, when, if you remember, there were a lot of news about migrant caravans coming from Central America, uh, groups of people who uh, bounded together for safety, traveling to ask for asylum to the United States. Um, and the local firefighter who had decades of experience in tactical rescue when he saw these spo uh, spools of concertina wire come, come up, he said he was, uh, he was dreading the day when they would have to extricate a person entangled in these uh, bladed coils. He didn't have to wait for long. Some people got away with uh, cuts to their hands or gashes. Others have died. With the onset of COVID-19, this year, in late March, the Trump administration closed the U.S.-Mexico border to non-essential travel, and this closure has been extended multiple times. Um, court hearings for over 60,000 asylum seekers, and these are the numbers of the people who were waiting back in March, 
uh, were suspended, leaving them to wait even longer uh, than they already had in very precarious uh, conditions without access to medical care and other forms of aid, a situation that had been made worse now that fewer humanitarian volunteers can cross the border. In addition, CDC, based on a 1944 Public Health Service Act, which allows the Surgeon General to suspend the introduction of persons or goods into the US on public health grounds, authorized CBP to do summary expulsions of non-citizens at land borders. This is again a rule that primarily applies to asylum seekers. Nobody checks whether these non-citizens are actually ill or contagious. They are turned around as quickly as possible in violation of the Refugee Act of 1980. Daily life on the border has also been severely affected by the difficulties of crossing back and forth for such mundane matters as visiting family members or shopping. Um, restrictions apply more rigidly to Mexican nationals going north than to US residents going south, even though COVID-19 cases began rising in Arizona. And even today, there are three times, the incidence rate is three times higher in Arizona than in Sonora. Um, of course, testing remains uh, quite limited in both uh, states. And all the while, the construction of the border wall has been continuing. So these developments are only the latest chapter in a much longer story about security, injury, and rescue on the US-Mexico border that I detail in my book and that I am going to share with you today. From 2015 to 2017, I conducted ethnographic research in municipal, county, and volunteer fire departments on both sides of the US-Mexico border in southern Arizona and northern Sonora. My fieldwork entails spending shifts with firefighters who in this region also provide ambulance services. That's not um, everywhere. So they are trained at least at the level of emergency medical uh, technicians. Some of them are paramedics, which is a higher level of training. Um, and I accompanied them in the daily activities, both at the firehouse and on calls. Myself being trained as uh, a wildland firefighter, an EMT and a paramedic, I also volunteered at the Nogales Suburban Fire District and with the humanitarian organization Tucson Samaritans at the Migrant Aid Center in Nogales, Sonora, run by the Kino Border Initiative, providing medical care to migrants. I also interviewed ER doctors at the Regional Trauma Center and att attended binational emergency management meetings and plannings and exercises and trainings that were organized both either through FEMA or the EPA in both US and in Mexico. So emergency responders are tasked with mitigating dangerous situations that arise from any combination of forces, including crises that result from this lethal overlay of security policies and the natural or built environment. And I am taking their pragmatic perspective as my vantage point to examine the effects of border militarization on human life. Emergency services espouse an ethics of anti-politics. The star of life on, the uni on our uniforms um, signal a uh, commitment to humankind regardless uh, of impartiality and conflict in any conflict and uh, treatment of anyone regardless of individuals race, ethnicity, religion, gender, legal status, or criminal background, just like the Red Cross on medical tents and war zones. As one fire chief told me once, we all have the same red blood. But especially 9-11, fire and emergency medical services in the United States have been ever more tightly integrated into the national preparedness and homeland security apparatus. And the work of emergency responders has become more fraught with tension, particularly in the borderlands. Every time they are called to rescue an injured border crosser, they see the effects, uh, the impacts of security build up on human body. I, I'm thinking, I was thinking about this when I was writing a book 
that emergency responders work in between these two hands of the state, uh, the way foreign sociologist Pierre Bourdieu defines them, where the right hand is responsible for enforcing economic discipline and social order, and the left hand provides social uh, welfare and medical care. So the contradictions and dissonance that they experience working between these two hands that are pulling them in different directions have become more profound and jarring over the past two decades. And I want to focus specifically, I work in several border communities, but most of my time I spent in, uh, in a place that exemplifies the negative effects of border militarization. Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Sonora, or ambos Nogales, both Nogaleses, are twin cities or one by national community bisected by the border fence, which already meets most of the specific desired specifications for uh, Trump's new wall. Its failure as a security infrastructure is very well known. It doesn't stop illegal drugs or unauthorized border crossers, only reroutes them, and that raises the cost for both forms of trespassing and thus makes organized crime more profitable. Smugglers use technologies both very new, such as UAVs and, um, and, and even drones, as well as archaic, like tunnels. Over 100 tunnels have been discovered in Nogales alone. They also use catapults and makeshift ramps, as you can see in these pictures. And it is well known that the biggest loads of, in terms of uh, drug trafficking comes through ports of entry mixed with vegetables and fruit and hidden in spare tires. What is perhaps less known is for, for people who don't live along the barrier and what I decided to focus on is the capacity of this infrastructure to wound and kill. It may not provide an effective protection from security threats, whether these are real or imagined, but as a mechanism of injury and MOI, this is a word that we use in emergency uh, responder community, the existing fence has shown consistent results. So my very, uh, my very first call to attend an injured person on the US-Mexico border in May 2015 was for a 30-year-old woman that I write about in the book. She had uh, bilateral open ankle fractures. Um, and just a few days later, we were back at um, at the wall at a little different part of, at, at a somewhat different part of Nogales and the, the other woman that I saw was also in her 30s she had a, um, a, a laceration to her forehead and also uh, we suspected spinal uh, and possibly head injuries so these were um, incidents that were so repetitive that over the last two decades, uh, border-related trauma has become so common in Southern Arizona that it has become um, normalized. Emergency responders who have been working there for much longer than I have uh, and who have been dispatched to care for patients with orthopedic injuries, they often call them fence jumpers, with such frequency that they were referring to the cement ledge abutting the firewall the, the border wall as, uh, as the ankle alley. Border wounds do not work the same way as injuries linked to other geographies and histories of violence. When trauma happens abroad, particularly in uh, places, in countries governed by regimes accused of having a dubious human rights record, scars of torture, uh, and other bodily imprints of force become evidence of victimhood and vulnerability, corporeal markers that entitle people to um, seek asylum. But border wounds, because they are caused by the policies of the very state that they are trying, uh, the border crossers were trying to reach, seem not to uh, merit the same kind of mercy. On the contrary, these border wounds become read as evidence of a crime uh, of having entered the country illegally, which until recently the US law classified as a civil offense, although that has been changing now. But in the popular imaginary, this rather mild violation of the law 
precede, sometimes precedes and substitutes for a possibly more serious one suspected trafficking. So in the eyes of the government, unauthorized migrants are always already read and implicated as criminals. They stand in for the narcos and the murderers and the rapists that conjure up fear in the nationalist political rhetoric. And reading uh, these traumatic injuries as evidence of crime has made the blurring of emergency medical services and border policing possible. So for many of the injured who don't have authorization to be in this country, the provision of life-saving care has become contingent uh, on them being taken into custody of the border patrol so that the border patrol accompanies the ambulance to the hospital and once the patients are, uh, uh, once they receive care and they are released, they are then processed for detention and deportation. And immigrant policing also extends to emergency responders, emergency caregivers themselves. A lot of the EMTs and paramedics I worked with, they are, some of them are by national uh, citizens. A lot of them are of Mexican descent and identify as Mexicans or Mexican Americans. They have had families who have lived in this region for more than a century, uh, some of them. And they are routinely subjected to being profiled at border patrol checkpoints that have been erected on all northbound roads, even when they are wearing uniforms with the insignia of their local government, uh, they are, their belonging here is put into question by federal agents who are often newcomers to the borderlands. So the border is a projection of state power and as such, it has a history both longer and shorter than we acknowledge when we talk about how it codes people and things into categories of legal and illegal based on prevailing ideologies that assign value. And this history um, matters. The border between Mexico and the United States is only about a century and a half old. It was established as you probably all well known in the middle of the 19th century following a conflict, which in the US we remember as Mexican-American War, but which in Mexico is known as the US intervention. Sorry, I just looked at the chat window, which I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so US intervention, which ended with Mexico taking over more than a third, um, ended up with the US taking over more than a third of Mexican territory or half if we count Texas that seceded before the war. The Joint uh, Boundary Commission spent seven years trying to demarcate this, uh, this boundary uh, and map the jurisdictional divide between the two countries, a divide which split the homelands of Tohono O'odham, Pima, and other indigenous people who have lived there long before the Europeans arrived. And the commission uh, in Nogales to mark the border uh, only put in the, a small pile of rocks, which was later replaced by an obelisk um, to de designate the boundary. It wasn't until the Mexican Revolution, which largely coincided with the First World War, um, that the US government sent National Guard troops to patrol the border. There was still no physical barrier between the countries, but there were several skirmishes that left people on both sides dead uh, because bullets, uh, straight bullets crossed the border. Um, and the uh, authorities extended a strand of barbed wire fence along the center of the street that is known as International Street on the US side and Calle Internacional in Mexico, which was soon replaced by a six foot chain link fence, which remained the material form of the border for over 60 years. Neighbors, residents of this town called it the picket fence between neighbors. It was easily disassembled during official holidays, including both US, American and Mexican independence days. And it allowed ties between the communities to be maintained. But all of that changed, began changing seriously in the 1990s with a series of campaigns 
Operation Blockade, Hold the Line in El Paso, Texas, Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego, Tijuana area. In Arizona, it was known as Operation Safeguard, and it put into practice Border Patrol strategic plan, which assumed that people who are crossing uh, the border without authorization do so because of the weak controls that exist on the borders. So the centerpiece of this plan was the prevention through deterrence strategy, which called for bringing in a decisive number of resources to bear in each major corridor, primarily in urban areas. And this meant increasing number of agents aided by more sophisticated fencing, as well as technology, such as night vision scopes, the use of ground sensors that had to raise the risk of apprehension to such level that people cons would consider it futile to attempt illegal entry. This is what I quote from the plan. So as part of this new strategy of border security, the chain link fence in Nogales and some other communities, this pictures from Agua Prieta um, uh, and Douglas border, it was replaced by a barrier that was made from surplus steel planks that US military used as portable pads for landing cargo aircraft, planes and helicopters during the Vietnam War. Even the US Army Corps of Engineers who designed these solid corrugated steel panels acknowledged the flaws of their construction. The landing pads had rough edges that frequently ripped the tires of aircraft. And once after Vietnam, when they became army surplus, the Border Patrol took them as, took advantage of them as free construction materials and redeployed them to the border with Mexico. Nobody liked this fence, not the residents who disliked the color that resembled an old bruise. Um, not the Border Patrol, because although the fence was not tall, eight to 12 feet only, it was opaque, so they could not see uh, what was happening on the other side, uh, and that gave border crossers a tactical advantage. So in 2011, several years after the passing of the Secure Fence Act in 2006, which was Bush administration's response to 9-11, the landing mats in Nogales were removed to build a sturdier and taller bollard style barrier made of these rectangular tubes steel tubes reinforced with concrete, with metal plates on top, extending up about 20 feet above ground and in some areas up to 10 feet below the surface. The see-through design, it had four inch gaps between the bollards, allowed for situational awareness, which the Border Patrol liked. Uh, and until recently, there were about 650 uh, miles of fence along the U.S.-Mexico border, covering about one third of the entire boundary. Over a little more, more than half was pedestrian fences, like the one you, you see here, and the rest were vehicle uh, type barriers, like these Normandy barriers that you can see in the picture. Under the Trump administration, um, According to what I found on the website just a couple of days ago, the government has completed 360 miles of border fence. Most of these are um, replacements of earlier barriers. So either the landing mat fences, in other cases, uh, replacements of uh, vehicle barriers. In some places they're secondary fences. So according to those who know, perhaps only five uh, miles of fence have been built where none existed before. Um, the, some of the new construction has taken place in the Organ Pipes Cactus National Monument, which is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, uh, and various groups have raised concerns about the wall's detrimental effects for the environment and endangered species and destroying archaeological sites. This Monday on Indigenous People Day, People's Day, a group of um, protesters led by the uh, Tahona Autumn were taken into custody because they blockaded a Border Patrol uh, checkpoint. And not even COVID-19 seems to have stopped the construction of this big and beautiful wall. There are active sites, um, active construction sites in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. 
um, and much of this is being done with funds diverted from the Department of Justice. So what, what are the effects um, that these new type of offenses had on people who were undeterred by them? The changing design of the barrier has produced different, different types of wounds. The landing mats that were made of that corrugated steel metal, um, sheet metal, caused primarily gashes, amputations, and some degloving and degloving injuries. So, one of the firefighters that I interviewed about this, um, and and others as well, recounted how sometimes people would um, slip from the fence and uh, they would lose a finger that would fall on the Mexican side, and the patient was on the U.S. side. Really gruesome uh, stories. Now, uh, in, with the present wall, which is taller, falls from it usually results in multi-system trauma, which are very often uh, tip fib, uh, ankle, sometimes femur fractures, so lots of leg injuries, but also spinal and um, head trauma. Injuries are also not always immediate. The border wall did reroute uh, a lot of people, also delaying the onset of uh, is illness, disease, uh, disease, and trauma. The Border Patrol strategic plan correctly predicted that as a direct consequence of border security buildup in border towns, people would be deterred, I quote, forced over more hostile terrain, less suited for crossing and more suited for enforcement. So it purposefully pushed migrants further away from populated areas, rerouting them through the vast expanse of the Sonoran Desert where they become exposed to extreme environments. Numbers are not reliable, but over 7,000 people have um, died crossing the militarized region in the past two decades. And these are only the people whose remains have been found. This map, which is um, made in collaboration between um, it opens between the Pima County's medical uh, officer of the medical examiner's officer uh, office and uh, an organization uh, called Humane Borders. They keep track of all the locations where human remains have been found, and you can look by uh, by year. So even in 2012, you can see that all of these dots mean that people uh, people's remains have been found. In many places, people remain unidentified. Uh, a lot of them die from exposure um, and from de dehydration. So it, because of that, the desert has been likened by other scholars and human rights activists to, it was called, it has been called the killing fields. It has been called the massive open grave. During summer days, the temperatures rise above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. On winter nights, it drops be below freezing and migrants usually walk for several days and never carry enough water uh, and clothes and food. Um, so, but it is not only temperature. Um, emergency responders I worked with have treated people who have been killed or injured on the road, often when pickup trucks or vans um, that are carrying Sometimes over a dozen passengers roll over during pursuits by the Border Patrol, which they say they don't do anymore, but they do. Those who uh, walk along the washes or arroyos sometimes get uh, carried away during, by turbulent waters when it rains, and joint Mexican and American rescue teams have to walk the entire length of these washes. A lot of them start in Mexico and come, go into the United States to look for bodies. In 2015, when I did most of my research, they recovered five corpses. Um, what is important for me in my work is to, under, to, to, um, to show that these are not really accidents. They're not unexpected occurrences that happen unintentionally and result in damage. Emergencies on the border are deliberately caused by policies. Criminalization of my immigration, which has been part of this country's history for way longer, but 
that accelerated in the 1990s, further aggravated by concerns with terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11, led the US government to designate the border with Mexico as a source of threats and waging there what has been likened to a low intensity warfare. The border fence itself is a key component of what Border Patrol in their own vocabulary call tactical infrastructure. So it is a concept that they use to refer to an assemblage of materials and technologies that regulate movement. The agency calls it a force multiplier. The dictionary defines tactical as relating to small scale action serving a larger purpose, in this case, national security, and as a weapon of force employed at the battlefront. So infrastructure is tactical in both senses of the term. The wall is a weapon in um, the converging wars, the war on drugs, the war on crime, the war on terror, and now the war on immigration. Although if we take language seriously, it is perhaps it is not really a war, but what is more accurately described, borrowing from sociologist Stanley Cohen as a moral panic. To determine the placement of tactical infrastructure, at some point, some years ago, DHS devised an algorithm they called border calculus. It was part of the Secure Border Initiative, a multi-billion dollar program uh, inaugurated in 2005, which combined the expansion of physical borders, barriers with the creation of high-tech virtual fence that had to consist of surveillance towers that monitor activity and look for incursions using radar and sensors and high resolution cameras. So this border calculus bolstered the program's credibility by uh, making security appear like signs. And um, in the words of Gregory Giddens, who directed the Secure Border Initiative, the chart lays out, I quote, a very simple algorithm that our ability to respond to a border incursion needs to be much less than the time it takes an illegal alien to get to a vanishing point. Again, I look at the dictionary and I ask, what does he mean by vanishing? Vanishing as in passing from sight or as in passing from existence, or maybe both. But migrants are not the only um, victims of border militarization and fortification. Tactical infrastructure also harms communities on both sides of the international divide. Arizona, which you can, in this image, you can see um, on, the, on the top, um, and Sonora on the bottom, Arizona is actually downstream, downhill, and downwind from Sonora. So as emergency uh, planners in southern Arizona often say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in Sonora, in Nogales, Sonora, doesn't stay there. It comes and affects us. It is not only wildfires and flash floods that spread north um, or south, um, or wildfires, but also toxic spills involving the release of hazardous materials from derailed trains and uh, incidents at the maquiladoras. And government officials at federal, at local, and at, um, at state and at local levels have long been aware of this entanglement and interdependence of the two countries. In 1983, US and Mexico signed La Paz Agreement which obliges both countries to notify each other about emergencies that occur within 100 kilometers, which is 62 miles um, on either side of the boundary. The US Forest Service and the Mexican National Forestry uh, Commission have an agreement that allows them to share resources and for firefighters to cross back and forth to fight fires within 10 miles, uh, 10 mile radius on both sides of the border. And split cities such as Nogales have mutual aid agreements that allow them to assist each other in, in emergencies. And all of that makes sense because the logistical infrastructure is intermeshed both on the surface and underground. Uh, the roads and train tracks link Arizona and Sonora, circulating commodities until the onset of COVID, about a third of all fresh uh, produce imports from Mexico to the US we're passing through Nogales. The Nogales wash, which is this intermittent stream that passes through uh, these tunnels that you can see in the pictures, as well as pipelines. One of them is carrying uh, raw sewage to a wastewater treatment plant in Arizona. Uh, they cross the border perpendicularly. 
There are talks of creating a joint electric grid. So trying to disentangle these two communities based um, on jurisdictional boundary conflicts with the pragmatics of public utilities and with the operational logic of emergency response. And fire departments specifically on both sides of the border have been sharing resources for over a century, for longer than the, any type of fence existed. Since Nogalia Sonora has few water hydrants and the water pressure is pretty low there, firefighters from Nogales, uh, Nogales, Arizona have for long either shuttled water across the border or sometimes connect hoses of Mexican firefighters to hydrants on the US side uh, to provide them water. Or as in this photograph, which has become a symbol of binational cooperation at the local level, when there was a hotel fire in 2012 in Nogales, Sonora in Mexico, the uh, Arizona firefighters brought their brand new ladder truck and helped, although they couldn't cross the border at this time anymore, um, they, uh, they crossed it overhead uh, above the, the, the fence to help extinguish the fire. In the borderlands, what's important is that in the borderlands, public safety cannot be contained within the contours of the state. But while city administrations and the Forest Service and even the EPA are working to strengthen these ties with Mexican counterparts as a matter of public safety, other government units continue to build barriers and heighten territorial divisions. To speed up the construction of the wall, first in the aftermath of 9-11 and now since uh, President Trump took office, the DHS was authorized to waive almost around 40 uh, different federal laws, including Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and other regulations that are preserving clean air and migratory birds, national forests and rivers. Militarization of the border exacerbates the potentially disastrous effects of environmental phenomena. And here is a case in point. In 2008, CBP installed a five foot barrier inside an underground tunnel uh, through which rain, this arroyo, the wash passes from Mexico to the United States. So when the runoff from a heavy rain rushed downstream from Mexico, the concrete barrier formed a bottleneck the water pressure kept rising until a thousand feet of the tunnel collapsed. Streets in Ogale, Sonora were inundated. There was damage to almost over 500 homes. Uh, US officials recovered two bodies from the wash, suspecting that they were unauthorized migrants who were in the tunnel when the, the rain began. And although local uh, mayors of both towns called for investigation into what happened, called for reparations, the federal government's only concession to the mayors of the split city was to grant permission to lower the concrete barrier by a foot and a half. Not all emergencies or accidents are so shocking, dramatic, and visible. Let me share just one final example. Like water and fire, air heats no jurisdictional boundaries, and addressing air pollution requires binational efforts. Not only does, does the border fail to prevent the circulation of air pollutants, but it can further exacerbate the problem of generating more particulate matter. Exhaust fumes from trucks that are idling at, um, um, at the border uh, inspection, um, waiting for, for, to be inspected at the Mariposa port of entry, which is uh, in the new, newer port of entry, mostly for commercial uh, traffic in Nogales, like exhaust fumes constitute a major source of uh, pollution. The other one of toxic emissions, the other one, the other source is maquiladoras in Mexico, which are routinely evading environmental regulations uh, and are also very much linked to US economy. The EPA listed reducing air pollution as one of the goals of its binational border programs, but that was several years ago. And the government of Arizona even paid, used federal grant money to pay truck owners in Mexico to replace old mufflers with new catalytic converters to reduce harmful diesel emissions. So they understand this, um, this as one, one community and also one in, environment. 
And I want to end here because this last example shows the entanglement between the communities on both sides. Since Threshold, since my book came out, I was mostly asked um, to talk about migrant injuries because that part of my work speaks to, to the brutality and to the futility of militarizing the border and of building the wall. But what emergency responders and the residents of these um, binational communities they serve have repeatedly told me and are telling me is that their lives are defined by and depend on the strong ties and lasting partnerships that cut across the jurisdictional boundary and security infrastructure erected to uh, enforce it. That the border may be a metaphor for some, a symbol, a projection of fears or hopes, a symptom that the body politic is unwell, the last attempt to shore up eroding state sovereignty. Borders may very well move like the people they aim to contain. So now that borders are everywhere and pegged from the map, but it is also for them, uh, for them primarily, a place, uh, their home, and this home is being torn apart by policies that are oblivious to local realities, oblivious to what it takes to live in the borderlands. So I will end there. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Eva, thank you so much. Uh, it's so powerful. Really appreciate this presentation and the information that you are sharing with us, your insights, and uh, uh, demonstrating for us the complex of factors and forces and implications and consequences for communities, for people, for individuals. Um, of the kinds of policies that we're seeing um, pretty pervasive cross-culturally, cross, across societies and countries. Thank you so much. So one, one thing I, I need to um, ask you before we turn to the Q&A is the pronunciation of your name, which I said as Yiva Yusiante. Is that incorrect? <laughs> That's <laughs> That's very, very close to correct. Uh, I've seen, I've heard so many variants. The, the Lithuanian pronunciation is Yeva Yusonite. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> okay, no wonder I didn't get it quite right, but I, I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you've said your name here. So um, I'm going to turn this over now to Barbara, who is going to... Um, uh, uh, point to individual people who have questions, and I assume that there are questions. So I'm going to disappear again, and then I'll come back at the very end to say thank you again and goodbye to everybody. Okay, I actually welcome people to put their cameras on if they'd like, um, and if I call on you to um, for your question, especially if you want to be on camera to read it, it would be great. If you don't want to be, it's fine. I'll read it then. Um, so the first person up is Nicole Leggio. Nicole Leggio, are you here? Uh, yes. Okay, can you? Um, I was wondering that, uh, do you think that the government thinks that the large numbers of people being harmed show success in the structures that are built in their eyes? Like since the government rules are being broken, they think the harm is deserved because you said the people are already considered criminals by the government. And that possibly what you said in the beginning, like they just don't want negative publicity. Thank you for the question. I think um, yeah, both yes and no. The policies are successful in that they are hurting people but they do not work in the way the government intended. They do not deter anyone who really uh, has no other option but to try to cross the border without authorization from trying to do that. A lot of, in, in most recent, in the last several years, most of the people who have presented themselves at the border are actually not 
crossing it through the desert. Very few of them are climbing over the wall. Most of them are looking for the border patrol um, to turn themselves in and to ask for asylum. Some of them are waiting at the ports of entry for their turn to ask for asylum. So we see different, um, different ways that people are approaching the border. The reason I'm saying that it's not even working uh, as, a, as this horrendous machine of wounding and injuring people is because it is very expensive in a way to treat all these injured migrants who right now during the COVID pandemic, they are using the excuse of this 1944 act that allows them to expel people without sometimes taking them to the hospital. But usually people who are injured are taken to the hospital and that the care, the health care in the United States, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is extremely expensive. So it is counterproductive. I have filed um, public, I have filed um, Freedom of Information Act um, request to know how, uh, how many wounded border crossers has, the, the Border Patrol has um, taken custody of and what, kind, what effect that had uh, on, on the taxpayer's money but it's been over three years and that request is still pending. I, I did not get the answer. Um, but one of the things that the, the, the people at least I spoke into in the government that they do recognize is how expensive it is to treat people who come across. Um, so that way I, I'm not sure it is working and it is definitely not working to, to to deter um, other, other forms of um, unauthorized activity, primarily drug trafficking, what is the border is often advertised for that as well. Um, next up is Nicole Fabrican. Yes, thanks so much. This was such a great presentation. Um, so I guess I have a two-part question. As you were talking, I wanted to ask you about this toxic entanglements, because I'm interested in this question too, as you know. And I wonder to what extent you see a connection between hyper-militarization, and obviously this is extending way beyond Mexico, <laughs> U.S. borderlands into our own spaces of protest and resistance, and environmental justice or environmental toxicity. Like, to me, the two are flipped sides of the same coin. Um, so I wonder if you could expand upon that a little bit. And then obviously as I'm deep in the trenches of writing, I also want you to talk about how you made your ethnography so accessible. Um, and I think it's one of those very teachable ethnographies, right? So like undergraduates sort of eat it up and what strategies or tips would you give folks for finding that kind of narrative voice? Thank you, Nicole. It's so wonderful to see you. Oh, um, see you and I can't wait to read your book <laughs> manuscript. <laughs> it's almost there. It's almost, almost there. there. <laughs> um, I think this question is very, very interesting about um, the intersection of militarization and toxicity and environmental justice. Just, just like a few days ago, there was, there was news that the border um, some of the like the construction materials and barriers that the US, uh, the, the constructors, they are dumping them into Mexico. Um, and uh, of course, Mexico in a lot of these situations, they don't have any say. One, because they are, they are agencies responsible for the environment, they are underfunded. So most of the money used to come through the EPA and the EPA used to have these border programs, border 2012, then border 2020, that they invested in, in binational regulation of air pollution, of clean water, but all of that has been suspended since well, for the past maybe almost four years. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, on the ground level, there is a lot of protests that are going on by environmental groups. Um, like the Sierra Club, like environmental organizers, as well as indigenous organizers who are sometimes working together with environmental groups because this is their homeland and the, 
the wall is going not only across their grave sites, but also um, across um, ac across their homes. Um, so the more the more the border becomes militarized, the more not only you have like air and water pollution, but also the materials with which they build and construct these infrastructures that are then um, left in the landscape, including the ra these ranges where border patrol agents go practice, mm. like all the lead from the bullets, all of that is basically remains in the landscape where cattle graze and where uh, wildlife goes back and cross across the border. So there is, there is a lot of intersection there. And I think I, that, that's one avenue that I want to keep thinking about. Um, as for the teachability and writing of Threshold, thank you. That's such a nice compliment. Um, I think one way I was thinking about the audience, I really wanted this book to be read, not just by as much as I value other scholars as well as students, but I did, I did write it in with my with my colleagues in the emergency department in mind. I wanted them to be able to understand even my theoretical arguments. So those I tried to uh, keep to to the not to bare minimum, I would say, but to what what do I really want to say? Um, finding my voice and feeling the urgency of it. So the book came out in 2018. I only began research in 2015 for this book. It was a very rushed book, but because I could not sit down and hear the news about the construct, the building of this new, the prototypes are up and the border construction began, I could not, I could not afford sitting and waiting uh, and making, like polishing it. So mm -hmm. I think that, that urgency also drove part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next person is Ed Snyder. Uh, hello. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to thank Professor uh, Yusanita for a just outstanding presentation. Uh, I'm Ed Snyder. I'm in the uh, faculty in the Department of Anthropology here at John Jay. My question is, um, first responders in the United States um, are praised and idealized and um, in U.S. culture, and I think this is something that kind of, you know, relates to certain uh, security moments um, in, our, in our country. Uh, and I'm just curious in your field research um, how you see them yourself and also how does the local community of Nogales see them? You mentioned that Border Patrol are outsiders and I'm just curious what the insiders think about these first responders with whom you worked. Thank you. Um, it is it is a little, it's, it's a difficult question. I have, I have been emergency responder before I ever set foot in the borderlands. I began here in Cambridge, Massachusetts and later in Florida. And I think there was a difference to this hero, like how the heroic figure of, of the firefighter specifically. Right now we, we are focusing a lot on medical uh, caregivers but they do not have they do not have the same elevated status in in the um in the in this country as the heroic firefighters especially after 9 11 but going going back to the oklahoma um city and like the, those images are very powerful i think on the border it was a little less pronounced just because the the that the value the heroization of emergency responders in mexico is not at the same level as it is in the united states a lot of people there are volunteers they they um although their service to the community is valued a lot and they do that because they have a calling to do that um not because it's a good job with benefits and retirement it's not that working class 
um, position that this that a lot of uh, people in in the U.S. cities aspire to uh, in many communities that I noticed. So there was perhaps, and 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 there was the difficulty of of matching what emergency responders were doing for the community and their role in the United States. The fact that they had to be part of this country that, or the, the state that is looking down on, on Mexicans. Uh, and they were, many of them, as I said, were Mexican. They were invited into a lot of these joint trainings with other firefighters from other parts of the country and they always felt as an as outsiders so they were a little bit with within that community but they felt the exclusion uh they were not never completely inside this heroic um emergency responder community um and and that was a very i think they felt Quite a few of them felt conflicted about that and what to do with that. They um, they have a very good relationship with the local um, residents, but that depends on the fire departments so much. So so today I, I spoke primarily of Nogales, which is a binational community, but there are other rural fire departments where I worked in Erivaca, Sonoita. Um, three points I visited, uh, some other, other parts, Green Valley, that are much, they, they are not, they do not have Spanish speaking firefighters. Some of them will have very few. They, they are different, they have different attitudes towards border security and different attitudes towards unauthorized migrants. Um, it is really as, as if the, the checkpoints uh, on, on US, like w they can be quite like several um, dozen miles within the un within the US territory. Like we have that, what uh, Miguel Diaz Barriga and Margaret Dorsey call a constitution free zone, uh, where things things are different above it and below it. And it's very hard to generalize. So they partake in that myth of uh, heroization but all but not entirely there is always that non-inclusion that's part of their experience thank you eva um the next person up is daniel arasanya are you here daniel um, um, yeah. yeah great um so um i have two questions and um my first question is, um, you said something about um, immigrants being like, you know, portrayed as criminals by the government. Would you uh, consider that as like, you know, racism or something like that? Uh, I don't know. And uh, my second question is, um, you made a quote that says, we all have the same red blood. Can you emphasize on that? Uh, what was your question about the, the quote? I'm sorry. Uh, you said something about, we all have the same red blood. Um, could you emphasize on it? Like what, um, because you said something that related to it, so I wanted you to like emphasize on it. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, definitely the criminalization of uh, migrants is part of the racial ideologies of the United States. If you go back to the, what, what kind of groups uh, were excluded um, from, from inclusion, from belonging, from citizenship, whether whether these were um, all all if we go through the U.S. immigration law, these have always had um, racial underpinnings. What what kind of migrants do we consider desirable? And these were migrants from Western, Northwestern Europe primarily. So not Asians and not Mexicans and not even uh, not European Jews and not Italians and not Greeks and these have changed through um, through the decades of what the U.S. considered as that un group of undesirable that is not um, not uh, warranting inclusion and often this coincided with criminalizing them for certain practices whether it is opium or whether it is marijuana or whether it is um, 
well, a any any uh, any uh, practice like outlawing came in layers, and those were racialized um, racialized forms of exclusion. As for for we all have the same red blood. That quote, uh, the the chief who told me that he he's a very um, he has a very long family history in the borderlands from like he, his, um, uh, I don't remember, grandfather maybe or great grandfather was there during the Mexican revolution on the border. And he, uh, he's the first Hispanic uh, fire chief in, in that town. So he said, he said that quote uh, when he was taking me to show me the border fence in their town to emphasize that they didn't care who the injured person was. For emergency responders, all these considerations are suspended. You, you have your narrow focus to treat the wound, treat the injury. It doesn't matter your, your legal status. It doesn't matter your criminal background, the same way you would, you know, you, anyone is treated the same way. So I think that's what he tried to emphasize by saying that we all have the same red blood um but he also this was just an extracted quote right he went on to say that unfortunately um the u.s government is then making um some people more deserving of the care that they get uh, than than others beyond what the emergency responders can do Thank you, Eva. Um, we have another question from Elizabeth Dre. Hi. I'm having trouble with my microphone. I want to make sure you can hear me. Perfect. So I'm Elizabeth Dre from Arlington. I had the pleasure of having Yeva speak at a Border Stories event in Arlington that we had right before COVID. Um, so it's really great to, to listen to you speak some more. Um, I'm sort of really interested in this internal uh, struggle that I, I would like to imagine that the first responders are having done at the border, sort of between the, when the, the policies of our government and then the, seeing the actual impact on human beings. And if any firefighters or first responders spoke to you about an evolution, hopefully, of their thought on our policies, but if not, sort of that what that was what that journey has is like for them. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. It was a pleasure to be part of the the event in January and like past life. <laughs> the um, it's a good question. So the um, politics is generally a taboo topic or subject in the firehouse, and the reason for that is because these people have to depend on each other in, in life and death situations. So if you start discussing, <laughs> discussing abortion or uh, are you voting Republican or Democrat, that would create uh, friction within the community that might endanger the whole crew. However, <laughs> everyone is everyone knows what everyone is thinking and like there are these little smaller groups of uh, people that are more critical of government policies but again not everyone the way they deal with it most often is by joking so they they go they refer to humor they call themselves wetbacks they they internalize that when when the border patrol for example stopped uh stopped two of them driving a fire truck they retold that story so many times and they said yes because we look like Chapo Guzman and uh, I think Pablo Escobar yeah yeah and they and they laugh at it so they they understand um, they understand that the government is engaging in like they they hate the border wall because of how disgusting it is because it hurts people they are not naive they see that the whole the design the, the placement of these rocks by the fence are there so that when the person falls they can't run away they are injured further they understand that but in order for them to do their job they they have to like not 
think about it in a way. I think that there might be parallels with police officers or maybe the military in some cases. Although in, in the case of the military, maybe that obedience to the government is more pronounced. In their cases, they work for the local government. And even though they are integrated in the national one, they, they can distance themselves as much as they can. But there are frictions. There are, fr there are frictions with different layers of government and they're not satisfied, uh, but they are not political either in, in any way. Um, Okay, thank you, Eva. I think we only have time for one more question. And this one I am going to read from Jennifer Lee, because her mic is not working. So her question is, after conducting the ethnography and learning about the border protection that Trump has administered, do you have any suggestions of method or policies in mind to lessen the brutality that migrants face and the, pol and the pollution Sorry, my scroll is not working. <laughs> and the pollution the border has caused. So do you have any suggestions on lessening? Burden? Yeah, we need a complete overhaul of the immigration policy and border security um, policies as well. Just the fact that, um, that DHS, so the government is not unitary. There are different government agencies. And one of the things that I noticed in this case, for example, of how, how the EPA works, like how their practices are so different from what the DHS does. And FEMA, although it is under the DHS, has different priorities. So I think one, one of the way, one of the important things is to give more uh, more say or more decision power to local governments, local municipal states to some extent, but primarily municipal governments because these communities, a lot of it works on the local level and it is the federal policies that intervene without knowing how, um, and this is specifically for environmental policies as well, how, how life works in that community. For um, for immigration, we do need an immigration reform. Uh, and I mean, <laughs> there are so many, so many, issues. I think the border is violent because there is a symmetry and there is economic inequality that is being further exacerbated by the border wall. So some of the solutions will have to, will need a lot of reworking of our economic um, world order, not just in the United States, but some things including the immigration policy, including how asylum seekers are accepted, um, the fact that children should not be separated from their parents. Um, all of the money that the government is spending in, in, in building this structure that does absolutely nothing to, it, it's, it's a myth that it would prevent, uh, uh, prevent drugs or prevent people. All of that money could be invested in welcoming, in, in reviewing asylum cases and having more humane uh, immigration policies, uh, temporary worker programs. There is a lot that can be done there that's not fear mongering expressed in this, um, horrendous structure that um, that's that's just a monument to it's a futile monument to I don't know nationalist politics policies thank you and thank you very much and that last uh, statement you made is so powerful and uh, you know and when we think about solutions I think we have to uh, Ha, ha, keep in front and center what you just said. Um, what it says to me is that we have to ask ourselves, in whose interest does this insane policy serve? Insane and inhumane, because interests are being served. And what we need to make that clear, which I think your book does in many ways, um, and then we can start to figure out 
how to undo um, at multiple levels, on the material level, what you were saying about the economic world order, but also on the ideological level, on the political rhetoric level, uh, the language level, and I'm looking over at my colleague Shauna Trinch <laughs> when I say those words. Um, anyway, so this is, this is for, for us, this is part of an ongoing conversation that we have in our department and in our classes. And uh, this was, yours is such a beautiful and tragic and wonderful contribution to our, our knowledge bank and, you know, the, and, and will enrich the conversations we have amongst each other and with our students going forward and hopefully in, in finding a way to change uh, what is currently horrific. So thank you so much, Eva, for coming for spending time with us, for presenting. I, I strongly urge everybody to check out her, Eva's books. Um, they're fantastic and as has been discussed, I, I, the, as I said in the, in, the, in the beginning, in my introduction, you're such a beautiful writer. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 you know, you have a background in journalism too. So, you know, you have a lot of experience writing to, for multiple audiences and you can really tell. So I urge everybody to find a way to pick up the book threshold and, and, um, and, and discover more with Eva. So thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara, for, handling this. Thank you everybody who participate, who, can, who came, and those of you who asked questions. And we will see you um, at some point again in the future, perhaps in person, if not virtually, at the Anthropology Cafe of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York. And with that, I'll say goodbye. Thank you, Yiva. Thank you, Elise. This was amazing. And we'll be in touch. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Very good. And we will have a recording. If anybody, I'm going to, going to put in the chat and I'll send out to everybody for anybody that wants a recording to send to me. Anyway. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.